Get Rich Education is brought to you by Norada Real Estate and GREturnkey.com. Welcome to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold, giving you information and ideas on the investment that has turned more ordinary people into millionaires and billionaires than anything else and can provide you with more wealth and happiness than you ever thought possible. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, and educator, Keith Weinhold. Hey, welcome to GRE, Get Rich Education, episode 147. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold, back to help you build your wealth, and thank you for joining me across 182 world nations from Finland to Fiji to France, but you're not here for me, you're here for you. Get Rich Education is a self-education. It sort of plays into the Jim Rohn quote, formal education will make you a living, self-education will make you a fortune. Get Rich Education is a self-education. There is so much opportunity for you out there. It doesn't matter what college you went to, or it doesn't even matter whether you went to college or not. It doesn't matter what your grandpa's last name is. You don't have to follow the path. You don't need to be on some career track. It's really about not being a conformer. Do you really want to be a conformer in your life? It takes courage to live the way that you want to. And I'm telling you to take a step in that other direction. Truly, truly Fear and doubt destroy more dreams than failure ever does. Yes, fear and doubt destroy more dreams than failure ever does. Being wealthy is unconventional, kind of like I mentioned last week. So you can either be conventional or you can be wealthy. Well, what's unconventional then? Well, for you, it might be living in Southern California and investing in Birmingham, Alabama, single-family homes. That's not conventional. That's not being a conformer. For you, it might mean living in Brooklyn and having cash-flowing real estate, passive income coming out of Kansas City, Missouri. Not conventional, but it might just be a wealth marker. Now, speaking of unconventional, one method is to create investment arbitrage for yourself by learning about how to make your money work for you two places at the same time because you've effectively created your own bank with something called the perpetual wealth strategy. And that's something that today's guest is going to tell us about. So it's about learning the right stuff and applying it, doing the right things being more important than doing things right. Besides a great guest today, we've got some fantastic shows coming up. The organizer and promoter of the esteemed New Orleans Investment Conference, Brian London, will be here with us on an upcoming show. We're also going to have an episode with a real estate market profile of a cash flowing property market that actually has some inventory during this time of thinner stock seemingly everywhere in seemingly every U.S. cash flowing real estate market where the stock is thin. But you can get a jump on that ahead of time by visiting getricheducation.com slash St. Louis. And well, now there's no suspense on which market we're talking about either. So I'm actually going to be in St. Louis next week as I tour the turnkey real estate market there. The last time I talked to today's guest was last year. We were having dinner on a cruise ship somewhere over the Caribbean. And one thing I remember about that night was that it was the cruise events formal night. So I was wearing this suit and tie, and I was hot as heck being an Alaskan off the shores of the Cayman Islands or wherever we were then. I'll be back with Paradigm Lice Patrick Donahoe in less than two minutes. You're listening to Get Rich Education. Cash flow real estate investors nationwide and worldwide, this is Get Rich Education's Keith Weinhold. Forbes has rated Memphis, Tennessee as the number one cash flowing market in the world. Our good friends at Mid-South Homebuyers have been Memphis's premier turnkey real estate provider for 14 years with a stellar reputation and an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. Owner Terry Kerr was born and raised in Memphis. Yeah, he knows the market and has renovated and sold over 1,000 houses in the Memphis area. Find out what their many repeat buyers already know. Their houses are completely renovated 
even come with a one-year builder's warranty and a lifelong rental guarantee. They're a perfect fit for the first-time out-of-state investor or the seasoned investor diversifying their portfolio. Mid-South Homebuyers Friendly Staff makes investing easy. Learn more at midsouthhomebuyers.com or give them a call at 901-217-HOME. Are you on track to achieve your financial goals? Income-producing real estate is the most historically proven way to accumulate wealth and has created more financial freedom than any other means. Norada Real Estate provides everything you need to invest in the best turnkey cash flow rental properties. Our simple proven system will help you create real wealth and passive monthly income. Get your free strategy session with our knowledgeable investment counselors at noradarealestate.com. That's N-O-R-A-D-A realestate.com. Hi, this is Russell Gray, co-host of the Real Estate Guys radio show, and you're listening to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold. Don't quit your daydream. Today's guest is the president and CEO of Paradigm Life. They're an insurance-centric financial consulting firm and PL Wealth Advisors. They're an investment advisory. They have a mission of providing financial education and sound financial strategy in order to provide the pathway of a fulfilling life. He is the host of the Wealth Standard Podcast, which has been on the air since 2007, really one of the earlier finance shows. And yeah, that's one show you might consider adding to your listening rotation. He's also the co-creator of the Cashflow Wealth Summit. That's a virtual financial conference with a cumulative 25,000 participants from around the world. He grew up in central Connecticut, and he currently resides in Salt Lake City, Utah, with his wife and their three children. In fact, he's often a featured speaker at investing events, so you might have met him in person. I was last with him in person on last year's Real Estate Guys Investor Summit at Sea. Welcome to Get Rich Education, Patrick Donahoe. How's it going, Keith? Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's good to finally have you here. You're one of those guests that I have once in a while where I'm like, wow, I thought we would have had this chat on the show sooner, but it's good to have you here. I'm a big fan, and you have quite the online presence, and I love reading your stuff, and also hats off to uh, becoming a Rich Dad Advisor contributor to their series. I always enjoy reading your stuff. Yeah, thanks. It's kind of uh, still a little bit unreal that I write for them sometimes. Like, these are the guys, Ken McElroy, Garrett Sutton, Tom Wheelwright, Robert Kiyosaki, that I grew up reading their stuff, so it's so cool to write alongside them. Patrick, we do a few things in common, but get rich education and a paradigm life. And I guess one of those commonalities is just generally kind of making people aware of the importance of building wealth outside of Wall Street and why one might try to do that. So I was just reading not long ago that if someone retires today, they have a 50-50 chance of living into their 90s. And someone might think, oh, well, that's great news. We have a lot of advances in medical technology, and we have a better standard of living than we used to have generations ago in this country. So they should be thrilled to live in their 90s. But, Uh you know, how are you going to have dollars to fuel that lifestyle? And that's perhaps why the importance of building wealth outside of Wall Street is more important than it's ever been. So what are your thoughts? Oh, man, that's a loaded question. I have a lot of thoughts there. I mean, the first kind of gut reaction to your statement is just the idea of retirement. I mean, I think as I've just experienced working with lots of people, talking to lots of people, observing the economy, observing industries, observing what people do with their money, observing what people do for a living, I found that really those that I consider are living a fulfilling lifestyle, a fruitful lifestyle, they don't really consider what they do work. They consider what they're doing a a contribution, and it provides value to other people. It earns them remuneration. And I mean, I I look at that, and it's really helped me make some connections with what I'm trying to do on a day-to-day basis. I think that really retirement has come about for a number of reasons. Obviously, there's some historical uh, significance in how they rolled out a lot of different you know, Social Security planning, pension planning, and so forth. But I would say this idea of retirement is really anti-life. And really looking at the probability, it like you said, it's like you have to save so much money, the traditional way to do that. And so I like to talk more about financial independence, not so that you sit on a beach and then you know play around with your grandkids all day long. It's more of you're able to do something that you love, do something that's fulfilling. And that in turn gives you a better income, more happiness, a better lifestyle all the way around. I mean, you live in a beautiful part of the world. Well, 
three or four months out of the year, that is. <laughs> you get to travel to, you know, a lot of cool countries and warm places when the sun is down for, you know, months on end in Alaska. But it's one of those things where you can do that because you found a, a profession, you found something that fulfills you, but also that a lot of people love to they listen to you, listen to your advice. And really, I think all people can find that. But really what holds them back is this habit or this social agreement that we all have that you have to go get a job. It has to have benefits. You have to have a 401k. You have to put money in the bank. I mean, there's a lot of these social arrangements that have been created and people really don't question them just because they're so prevalent. But I think once you peel back the layers and I started doing that, you know, 2008, 2009, where I saw how it affected me. I saw how it affected clients, how it affected the world. And really the scapegoat was like, the American people and their, you know, irresponsibility associated with debt. That wasn't the case, right? It was really the back of the room, Wall Street decisions, Fed decisions that hurt people and crippled them and they're continuing to do it. And so that's where it's really kind of a, a philosophical standpoint. I don't agree with retirement because it's anti life. I agree with achieving a, a level of financial independence so you can uh, find something that's fulfilling for you to do forever. But then also the you know outside of Wall Street is that Wall Street is a very self-serving industry where everything that is set up, it provides some benefit to the forward-facing consumer as far as what they say, but also there is so much back-end benefit to them where it behooves them to figure out any way possible to provide value to the front end. So you look at reverse mergers, you look at you know just how they're able to use massive amounts of leverage to do IPOs. There's so many backroom deals, so many things that have been exposed over the years. I don't want to get into all the details, but it really is an industry that wasn't what it used to be and is not going to be what's intended for a benefit to the consumer in the future. And the sooner people can awaken to that, the sooner their eyes are going to be open to other opportunities that are out there, whether it's you know with real estate or whether it's with alternative investments, whether it's there's so many different avenues. But I think that you are doing a great service. And I try to, you know, I, I look at you as kind of a, a mentor of somebody that hasn't really hid behind the curtain, but has really said, listen, this is how I feel. This is my observation of what's going on. I want to teach you and I hope you learn something and that it awakens you to figure out what is the right path for you. So that's kind of my mission as well is just to help people with me becoming educated and going down a different path than what they've been taught. I think those that work a job, you know, they're the type of people that think about the word retirement, maybe in those more traditional terms. When you have a job, you're basically selling time because you've basically given away control. You've ceded control to Wall Street, but you go ahead and take things on yourself and you have your own control. That kind of correlates with Main Street. And rather than selling time, now you're kind of buying time. And there's nothing like controlling your life into buying time. Not to get too philosophical, but life is made up of chapters of time. You have the opportunity to buy time with something like passive income, but Wall Street investor just is not thinking about that at all. They're not. And it's, again, it goes to that same idea. It's just, it's what we've been taught and, and people really just like, okay, well, that's what I should do. I don't need to do anything. So they don't, but then they find themselves in, you know, hurtful situations when life doesn't always go as planned. But you know what? One thing that I working on a lot, Keith, over the last, I would say like 18 months, you know, I have a lot of employees here. I have almost 60 people in our office. We have some people that work remote too. Yeah. But what I heard really, it made me very emotional, which is, you know, you look at a lot of the social issues that are going on right now with younger people, whether it's abuse, whether it's single parents, whether it's uh, suicide, there's all sorts of social issues right now and, and issues in the family. And the person that I, I can't remember who exactly it was, but they said that, you know, it could be the school system, right? It could be their friends, it could be the internet, it could be, you know, social media. So they list all these things. But he basically said, think about this. Parents go to a place every day and they work for seven, eight, nine hours. And because of the poor culture that exists in the workplace, it affects them so much because of the negative culture, the dog eat dog mentality. You have public companies that are always trying to hit metric after metric after metric after metric. And it really hurts the individual to the point where they feel devalued, degraded. And they go home and take that psychology to their children. Not to say that they don't have the intention of being a good parent, the intention of doing what's right, but they go home with that mentality. This guy basically was trying to show that this is a significant 
series of events that happen in the workplace that end up hurting young people. I step back and I, I totally revamped like our, the, you know, the culture here. And we do all sorts of, you know, things now that we didn't do before. Cause I heard that and I was like, that's not going to be me. I'm not going to be one of those guys that somebody goes home and they feel that way. I've been trying since, but my point is it's like the whole workplace, the whole job scene, it is in a sense negative. And I think people want to retire because they don't like that. And maybe they like what they do. They just don't like how they're treated. They don't feel that they're valued. And I think that, you know, if you deal with that over and over and over again, day after day, it's like the boiling frog syndrome. You get to the point where you've just had enough. And that's why people want to retire. But I would say the sooner people can get that through their mind and understand that, wow, our total workforce is changing. Society is changing. What you do right now, if you have a specialty or a skill, there's so many opportunities for consulting, so many opportunities to start your own business where you don't have to deal with that. And that's my point, Keith, behind kind of the retirement idea is just there's so many ways to change your life so that you can have freedom. You can have the fulfillment that everybody is really seeking. Well, sure. So much of it's mentality. And if you are the average of the five people that you spend the most time with, it's difficult to say out loud and it's difficult for people to accept this. And it's difficult to even joke about this. But people joke about the fact that they spend more time around their coworkers than they do their own family. Well, in your coworker environment, those coworkers, they weren't chosen by you. They were chosen by somebody else, but yet they're infecting the thoughts that you put into your head every day at the same time. You're totally right. And again, that's kind of what perpetuates society and perpetuates culture is just who you're hanging around. And we have a value here at Paradigm, which is be, do, have. And the be, do, have mentality is if you don't have the results that you have in life, then it's not because of you know this situation or that situation. It's because who you are. And so in order to change that, you have to become a new person. So if you're hanging around the same people that are in the same situation as you and expect that you're going to have different results, you're kidding yourself. It's that you know definition of insanity. Yeah, it's like they say, to change your life, you've got to change your life. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We talked about investing a little bit and going ahead and giving people alternatives outside of Wall Street and why they almost absolutely need that if they want to have the autonomy and the freedom that they have in their life. Paradoxically, and this comes down again to thinking in an opposite way, it comes down to one's understanding of debt. And you're out at a lot of these economic events where there's talk about monetary policy and banking policy and gold. So just what are your thoughts about debt today, whether that's how consumers are handling it, how they need to think about it differently, use of leverage and so on. What are your thoughts about debt today? That's a very insightful question. I have a few opinions about debt, but I look at it as I look at anything else, right? It's something in and of itself doesn't have a positive or negative definition. It's really we give the definition to it. Right. So if you look at is debt good or is debt bad, it's kind of like there. it depends, right? One person can say it's good. One person can say it's bad. This is what I would say is you look at, you know, just the statistics associated with individuals and how they manage debt. They're using debt for consumption. They're not using debt for production. So the consumptive attitude, I think it's a state of mind as opposed to actual tools or a financial statement. But right now, again, going back to Wall Street and going back to banking, that's how they make money. That's how they push forward. I mean, Wells Fargo opening three and a half million accounts should tell you like, wow, they need to really get <laughs> money out. There. You know, they need to get money out there. They need to sell stuff, right? So it's one of those things where banks are really pushing the agenda of doing more debt because really they've been given the charge kind of like from the Federal Reserve because what the Federal Reserve is trying to do is create aggregate demand, right? So the prices continue to go up. So consumers are essentially just continue to be burdened with credit card offers and automobile offers and mortgage offers and so forth. And, you know, I think this is just part of what's known as the Austrian business cycle, which is Federal Reserve or central bank monetary policy is always going to, yeah, create a benefit, uh, create part of the intention, but it's going to create so many unintended consequences where we're seeing it right now. Tons of automobile lenders are you know, having some of the highest default rates in history. You have the student loan dilemma where you have one and a half trillion dollars of student loans. It's just insane. And, and I heard a statistic that's almost 30% is in default. So it's one of those things where it's like, you're seeing the results of a poor monetary policy because you're saddling society, you're saddling uneducated people with more means to consume. But then I look at debt from how you and I look at it, 
And it's one of the most amazing tools. And I would say if you want to build wealth, you have to use debt because our whole society, how everything is priced is based on debt. Let's say, for instance, like a house, you know, mortgages were outlawed. What would the price of a, a single family residence be? Well, it's based on whatever a person can pay for it. So the prices would go down significantly. What would the price of you know, college education be, tuition, uh. if student loans were outlawed? Automobiles, the list goes on and on. Our whole society is based on debt. So if you want to buy an asset, chances are that asset is based on a debt. Debt is part of that equation. So you, using debt for real estate improves the rate of return. Using debt for your business improves the rate of return. So I would say you know, it's a paradigm shift, pardon the pun, but it's a <laughs> paradigm shift from consumption to production. You have to look at how to use debt the right way. Debt in and of itself does not have a soul or a personality. You and your education level is what gives it meaning and gives it purpose. And I would say debt can be your best friend. Debt can also be your worst enemy. Yeah, it is kind of a double-edged sword. So just real basically, in the consumer credit world, why does debt get a bad name? Well, debt gets a bad name because people see that they have to be the ones, the consumer themselves, the consumer that originated the debt, they're the ones that are burdened with the debt pay down or the debt payoff. So they associate debt with something that they're trapped underneath. And uh, in order to make my auto payment this month, I'm going to have to work overtime this weekend. So that's why debt's associated with drudgery or something undesirable. But of course, 180 degrees to that when we take out debt on real estate as real estate investors here, as long as the income exceed the expenses on a property, we found a way to reliably outsource that debt as long as that income stream is durable and we're buying real estate in a good and stable and sound job market. So debt can totally be our friend that way. I love debt. I have millions of dollars in debt and I only want to get more of it because it's all good debt and it's all attached to something where someone else is making those payments for me. So that's why I want more debt. Yeah, I totally agree. One of the biggest wake up call for me during kind of the 2008, 2009 period of time, because I started Paradigm before that and, you know, was just this naive guy doing a new business. But I experienced the evil side of banks, right? And I saw so many people abused, right? Whether it's their privacy, whether it was their bank accounts being garnished. I mean, banks are they're ruthless when it comes to consumer-based credit. And, and I would say looking at how to exploit them instead of them exploiting us is the best way to do it. It's like, how can you figure out a way to, you know, for me, I mean, I have Amex points or how do you use debt for real estate, right? Debt for your business. I mean, there's so many ways in which you can, you know, play their game. And if you play their game, you're going to win if you follow all of the rules. And that's the most important part. And you mentioned one, which is, you take out debt, there's collateral, you need to understand kind of, you know, personal guarantee side of things as well as recourse law and also understand kind of the terms of those loans. I don't think I've ever uh, talked about this experience, but before, you know, this was 2005, 2006, I was part of this uh, partnership and I personally guaranteed three construction loans in Missouri. And it was part of this development. Again, I was kind of naive, didn't know what the heck I was doing. And, you know, I personally guaranteed them. And what happened is the partnership dissolved. And I walked away and I had a lot of debt that I was paying back, part of the business. But then I had these like three, almost a million dollars worth of construction loans. The developer went bankrupt. The bank was taken into receivership. And then, you know, a year after that happened, I got this letter that said the thing wasn't even built, but yet the debt was sold and they were coming after me for the entire balance. And I was like, oh. I mean, it was such a stressful time. That was an insane time. But what ended up happening is I, you know, went in and I looked at recourse law and I looked at contracts. And I understood mortgage notes and the collateral associated with it. And I got off on, I know a lot of people uh, had to, you know, settle. They went bankrupt. I was able to learn some of those laws. I had help from an attorney. And, you know, I ended up, the note was written in, the, in Kansas and not Missouri. So there were different recourse laws that applied and they threw the whole thing out. So it's one of those things where I, I think you have to understand that even if you are an investor and using good debt, you still have to understand really what the bank's game is, understand those provisions, because in the end, things are never going to go 100 percent according to plan. Therefore, you have to prepare for contingencies. And that's just one of them is understanding where banks are coming from, what they do, how they do it. If you've never been through a negative cycle, ask someone who has. Find someone, a mentor or whatever that can kind of walk you through ways in which you can make sure that you're protected. Yeah, it was a few episodes ago. I was talking about the housing crisis of 2007 to 2009 and the lessons I learned and 
buying for cash flow. And even buying for cash flow is not enough. You need to buy for cash flow in a market that's durable. It's not about buying yeah. a property where you have a tenant that's paying you income today. It's having a reasonable expectation that there'll be a tenant coming in behind that once that current tenant leaves that can make that income stream durable. But yeah, it is about understanding of debt. And once you learn how to make debt work for you and that debt can be a good tool and it's something you can outsource to others, there are other things in economics that you previously saw as a menace, for example, inflation, that now becomes your friend. Once you brought debt onto your side and you understanding it and you're using it for your own gain, you can use inflation for your own gain too. Most people out there know that, well, inflation impoverishes savers, so that's why I don't want to keep too much money in the bank because there's an opportunity cost associated with that. In the consumer credit world, people associate inflation with something bad because they just don't want to see their Chipotle burrito go from $9 today to costing $10 tomorrow. They just see inflation as something that hurts them. <laughs> but at the same time, while inflation impoverishes savers, inflation enriches debtors really in just the same way. So when we tie up this long-term fixed interest rate debt, we have that debt not only being eroded by the tenant principal pay down, but inflation becomes our friend just the same. And we're really in a pretty low inflationary environment today. And a few years ago with the QE cycles that we had, people were predicting that we would be in a higher inflation environment. And you know, Patrick, as a, a highly leveraged real estate investor, or not highly leveraged, but I would rather say prudently leveraged, I'm rooting for inflation. I'm an inflation cheerleader. I'm like, go, go, go. To most people, they think that when the dollar goes to zero, their savings goes to zero. But the way I think about it is when the dollar goes to zero, my debt goes to zero. So what are your thoughts about the environment that we're in, deflation versus inflation, and so on? I'll add to what you said because I completely agree. And you know, the outcome, it's anybody's guess, right? Because there's a lot of people that predict like 3,000 things and then they get 2,999 wrong and then one right. <laughs> <laughs> First thing I would say is I love real estate. I own a lot of real estate. Uh, I think now is a very interesting time, so you got to be cautious about what you're buying and what the metrics are. And as you said, you know, in an area that is uh, sustainable and durable. But, but what I would say is, like with real estate, you have multiple things going on, right? First, you have the underlying asset. So assets, there is inflation. Assets typically rise in value, which is real estate. Real estate is a very uh, desirable asset because everything happens on real estate. You're on real estate. I'm on real estate. I look outside, real estate, you know, it's an underlying asset of pretty much everything. The second thing I would say is you have, you know, inflation that affects payments, right? Because if you have rent and, it, you know, that's the primary expense of an individual these days, if they're getting a raise, it increases the demand for, it increases demand, right? So demand goes up and prices go up and now you have a competitive environment where rents go up. And I've been able to do that with a lot of my units for the last several years is every time someone vacates, you increase rent, see what happens. And sure enough, somebody comes in and pays the higher amount. So you're able to kind of increase rents as well. Those rise with inflation. Not to say that you're getting more rent. You're probably getting somewhat of an equivalent rent to the purchasing power of currency. Okay? But still, rents are, are rising, keeping up with inflation. So now you have kind of two elements of the transaction, the hard asset and the payments that are going up. Now you have, as you said, you have debt. Because if you have fixed rate debt, the value of that debt will go down uh, based on the payments you're making on the mortgage, but also go down based on purchasing power because everything's locked in. Interest rates locked in, payments locked in. So the payment is actually reducing over time. And then the balance also is reducing over time. I fully agree with you. It's an amazing way to just kind of position yourself for multiple outcomes. Now, what I would say in regards to you know, what's going on in our economy with inflation and deflation it's such a fascinating period of time because you'd think we would have inflation, but there's been so much demand just because of the uncertainty associated with you know, international uh, jurisdictions and their banking systems and so forth. So there's this like, flood of money coming into the United States. And it's also been in, in real estate, which I'm, I'm sure is a different conversation as far as the international influence on the prices of multifamilies, developments. And if you have these countries that are okay with three, four, five percent returns, floods of money are going to come in and bid up the price of real estate. Yeah. So I would say that's a very fascinating uh, discussion, but I think you have two things going on. You have the Federal Reserve, which I think is out of their mind, trying to keep prices going up into infinity, right? Two to three percent per year, da, 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 year after year after year after year after year. That's not realistic because you have a period of time where technology 
is improving and it's deflationary. So you have technology that's really improving services. Uh, I mean, I had Comcast show up, my, up at my door a couple of weeks ago and cut my whole bill in half. And it was one of those things where it's improved, that technology is improving, other things are improving, where prices should be going down or at least staying the same, but quality improving. So it's like you have those, that influence and that force, but you also have monetary policy having the opposite force. So you're starting to see just, you know, a lot of what I consider malinvestment. You have a ton of VC money, a ton of private equity money that's in, you know, startups. And it's just basically all the guys at the top, the 0.1% are just like throwing money at this venture, at that venture, at this thing, at that thing, and, and seeing what sticks. They're the ones that are really benefiting from this amazing amount of capital that's flowing out there. So I don't know. It's a very interesting conversation as far as where it ends up. It really depends. I think it's all contingent on a variety of factors. Some of the policies of Donald Trump is pushing forward. Uh, I think international policies also play a role in it. So yeah, there's so many moving parts that it's kind of hard to tell exactly what direction it's going to go. But like, you know, Keith, like volatility, that's our best friend because when volatility happens, people freak out like normal people. That's where deals happen. Right. That's where we get the peaks and the troughs that we can exploit as investors. You know, Fed Chair Janet Yellen, she testified before Congress recently, and she actually showed a little bit of concern that inflation wasn't high enough. I think currently it's at 1.6, 1.7% per the CPI. And, you know, we sure can debate how faulty and manipulated the CPI is. But anyway, inflation is, is pretty muted right now. I, I know you have a hard time not laughing when I talk about 1.6 to 1.7% inflation. I think we all know it's significantly higher than that. But the Fed yep. does want some inflation because, well, for one thing, inflation dilutes the weight of the U.S. debt. So, you know, I kind of think the Fed wants higher real inflation, but they want to kind of fake it like it's low because on the other end, there are entitlement programs attached to that, like Social Security. And there are other things attached to to that, like the federal employee wages that they need to pay out. So I kind of think they want higher real inflation, but yet at the same time, they want to fake it like it's low. And yeah, you know, it's truly one of the most interesting economic tug of wars out there. The deflationary tug of technology and globalization versus the inflationary tug of the digital printing press, where we really have the power effectively to print all the dollars that we want in order to fight the deflation that we as investors and that the Fed doesn't want. Yeah. And I think also going to just adding on to what you're saying, you have you know, all this money that's that's out there and you have a lot of malinvestment that that's happening. And it depends on how you look at it. Right. You have, you know, CPI and consumer prices. There's also prices of, you know, assets and other things, too. But you you have this kind of continual bull market. It's like the longest running bull market in history. And this is what's fascinating, Keith. I think everyone like you know most retail investors know that. And it's one of those like they're waiting for just another tick, another tick, another percent, another percent. And once you see a correction, I think you're going to have huge sell offs because people are going to try to lock in their profits. And it's like sell, sell. That's where I think the volatility is going to, going to come from. But I also would say that that is like it starts a snowball because if you look at, you know, the pension system right now, just across the country in such a mess, like horribly underfunded. Tons of, you know, corruption happening behind the scenes with municipalities. And once you have a bull market, these pension systems are like, they're massive. And the sell-off that's going to take place there because of those, you know, institutions going into receivership, most likely, it's going to be, dude, it's going to be fascinating. It's going to be a fun time to kind of observe it. There's so many ways in which, you know, the cookie can crumble, but I don't know, I find it fascinating. There's all sorts of signs that are showing me that it could be another year out, could be right now, could be five years out. You know, it's anybody's guess. You know, I think Peter Schiff is the first one I heard this from. But I would say that, you know, Janet Yellen, one of the statements, which is we're probably not going to experience another like downturn or, or bear market in, oh, our, in our lifetime. I'm like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> why does she have to say that? There has to be an objective there. And she says it right. Push people's fear away. Right. Because, you know, most people, I think, I do have some semblance of fear associated with this. It's fascinating to just listen to not what they're saying, but like what the meaning behind what they're saying is. 
Oh, sure. Yeah, it's similar to comments Ben Bernanke made when he thought the mortgage crisis was going to be contained only to subprime. So, yeah, it's really a whole lot different than that. Well, Patrick, one of the things that you do in, over there at Paradigm Life is just really important to helping empower people kind of be their own bank and start working outside of this system and this institutionalization and outside of Wall Street. So just tell us a bit about what you do to help people there at Paradigm Life and banking. I would say that I learned about what I do from a mentor, like most of us. And she was one of the first Rich Dad Advisors. Her name is Kim Butler. And you know, I, I met her, found out what she did, and really kind of carved out a piece of a partnership I was involved with in 2007 to try to you know, replicate some of that uh, online. But then the whole 2008, 2009 mess happened and almost took me a number of times. Uh, but I actually reconnected with her and went to her and her husband's trainings for several years on end. And during that period of time, I was learning about you know, what they did and how if people had done that during the downturn, how incredibly protected they would have been and would have been able to, to thrive, right? Because of having cash, having liquidity, being able to take advantage of opportunities. So really at the fundamental level, we're an insurance uh, agency and we specialize in a type of insurance policy which is a, a unique way of funding a whole life policy to replace your opportunity fund, your reserves, your kind of residual savings. And the idea is that you're going to earn interest on it. You're not going to have to you know, mess around with issues with banks and deal with them. Because again, I had this huge dissatisfaction with wages getting garnished, bank accounts being raided by creditors. I don't have an affinity whatsoever toward traditional banks. And so it really became that kind of mission to help people learn that you could actually separate your savings, separate your opportunity funds, separate that from Wall Street or from banking system. But then you'd also be able to have a very unique feature of this insurance policy, which is a line of credit against it. So the insurance companies, number one, they're private. So you have these private accounts that nobody knows about other than you and them. And you also have private financing, which is guaranteed. So if you have your wealth stored there, you have your capital there, and then you have a deal come along, you can request a loan from one of these companies and they will EFT it, wire it to you so you can take advantage of the deal. It doesn't wipe out your savings. Okay, Your savings is still earning interest. They're giving you a line of credit. They're giving you a loan to actually do that deal. At a fundamental level, that's, that's how it works, but it's somewhat simple concept from the standpoint of looking at how banks work, right? You put money into a bank, and you keep it there, right? It's savings, whatever, you can pay bills and so forth. But then the bank takes that money, turns around, right, and lends it to somebody else. So what we teach is really, okay, this is where you store your capital. It's gonna grow, it's gonna earn interest, it's private, it's tax-free. But then the insurance company gives you the ability to borrow in order for you to do the same thing that the bank would have done, which is invest in an asset, whether it's real estate or your business, I mean, we've had thousands of clients that have done everything under the sun that you can imagine. Uh, some of it is kind of weird, but it's one of those things where they're doing what the bank would typically do. So if you add that to your quiver, it's just one of those things that can help improve your situation. By no means is it the end all be all, but it's a very valuable part of a wealth strategy. Yeah, so tell us about that just quickly with the perpetual wealth strategy about how when you've established, quote unquote, your own bank, how effectively you're able to borrow from yourself and then simultaneously you can use that money in two places and effectively create arbitrage that way. Going back to 2008, 2009, what, what saved me was my policies that I had at the time as well as my real estate because the real estate just kept coming in. Or the money kept coming in. And I lost a few properties, but the ones that I retained, the ones that were cash flowing, that was a big part of my income source. And I don't know if you've done this before, and I hesitate to mention it, but I would totally stretch out like my mortgage payments on these rental properties so I can pay my bills and feed my kids. And it's one of those things where it saved me. But then the policy also saved me because during that period of time, you know, I broke away from partners and I had issues with creditors that I had personally guaranteed. So I couldn't have a personal bank account because they would rate it and they did, they wiped out the, the account multiple times. So because I had my, my policies, I was able to loan money to my business. I was able to loan money just for personal expenses. So those two, you know, really real estate and my policies are the ones that kind of got paradigm through, got me through, got paradigm through those difficult times. And we teach a lot of those same principles today. But the idea is really the policy itself, the strategy itself, replaces two functions that everybody's already doing, where you store your cash and how you buy something, whether it's a rental property, whether it's put money into your business, 
So it replaces those two functions. It's very simple because insurance companies work in a very similar way to banks. They take in money for premiums and then they invest that money. So as far as these type of policies are concerned, it's the same thing. They take in your money, they house it in this account that's liquid, and then they will give you a loan against it, right? So it's not withdrawing your own money. They will issue you a line of credit at the value of that account for anything. It's a guaranteed line of credit. So you can use it for personal use. You can use it for business use. Very flexible in that regard. Yeah, and that can be really important if we hit another crisis because, you know, back during the mortgage meltdown, I had a HELOC second mortgage on a fourplex building that I did not live in, that I was running to others, and that was a six-figure HELOC home equity line of credit where I was actually getting pretty used to making regular draws against it and paying it back and kind of enjoying that elasticity and that spending or that investing I was able to do. And Bank of America shut it down because they were so concerned with what was going on during the mortgage meltdown. So besides potentially the arbitrage you create with being able to use your money in two different places when you set up your own bank, it's also not very likely to get shut down in the event of a crisis. Yeah. And there's so many uses and there's so many stories like that, Keith. Those are the games that banks play. I can't remember who the guy that said it is, but the bank's model is essentially to give you all the money in the world when you don't need it. And when you do, (laughs) make it almost impossible. And And I would say that a lot of people have experienced that frustration, are still experiencing it. And this is an alternative to that. Now, you do have to have some education around it. We provide, you know, a lot of online stuff so that you can just learn for free and how it all works. And so we've provided a lot of different tutorials and videos online that, uh, that people can get access to and, uh, and learn how it works. Yeah, I really recommend checking out some of those tutorials because it does take a little bit of time to get your mind wrapped around it. In fact, in-house here at Get Rich Education, my right-hand man, our lead business developer, John Collins, uses the perpetual wealth strategy in his life and for his investing. So it does work and really effectively it provides just sort of a tailwind to most of your investing life. So Patrick, why don't you go ahead and let our listeners know what is the best way for them to connect with you? I would just go to our website. That's probably the best, paradigmlife.net, P-A-R-A-D-I-G-M-L-I-F-E.net. We're still trying to get .com. Don't have it yet. It's this (laughs) very stubborn Australian crystal dealer (laughs) that won't give it up. So we're still on .net, so paradigmlife.net. You can follow me on Facebook. I'm on Instagram, too. So. Patrick Donahoe, thanks so much for coming on to Get Rich Education. It has been valuable. Okay, it was my pleasure. Thanks, Keith. Yeah, great chat with Patrick there. You know, if it came down to either high inflation or high deflation, if there were the threat of like either affliction out there, whether it was going to be significant inflation or deflation, I think I would rather have high inflation. Now, deflation might sound good to you superficially because that means that prices are falling, right? Who wouldn't want to have the same value delivered to them at a lower price that you would have to pay? But because deflation means that prices are going to be lower tomorrow than they are today, people postpone purchases. And when consumers cut their purchases, then business profits decrease. And unfortunately, this means that businesses have to reduce the wage that they pay And businesses also have to cut their own purchases. So in turn, this short circuit spending in other sectors, because now other businesses and wage earners have less money to spend, so it just kind of continues to get worse, and the cycle can be very difficult to break. Well, I don't think that the Fed is going to let that happen. Just look at the 100-year trend of the dollar falling, 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 and I'm expecting that we're going to get more of this same inflation. Check out ParadigmLife.net. That's the first link in the show notes for you today. The Perpetual Wealth Strategy. It takes some time to wrap your head around it, but they have a lot of great educational resources there, including where you can just sit back and watch some nice videos over there. I know a lot of investors that have increased their investment returns and their flexibility with Paradigm Life. For my developers, John Collins and Marcus Whelan, sound engineer Vidrun Jampo, web designer Nikon Roy, I'm your host Keith Weinhold, and I'll be back next week to help you build your wealth. Don't quit your daydream. You've been listening to Get Rich Education, telling you what the wealthy won't tell you about real estate and investing. 
Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.